City. This is Charlie Rose. The novel Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates has long been considered his greatest work. Set in the 1950s, it is the story of Frank and April Wheeler, a married couple who has achieved the American dream but still are not happy. Playwright Tennessee Williams declared, if more is needed to make a masterpiece of modern American fiction, I am sure I do not know what it is. Ever since the novel was published in 1961, filmmakers have tried to turn it into a movie. Joining me now, Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio. Eleven years ago, they started together in James Cameron's blockbuster Titanic. That film grossed more than $1.8 billion. Since then, they have earned a combined eight Oscar nominations. Now these two friends reunite in Revolutionary Road. It is directed by Sam Mendes, Kate's husband. And here is the trailer from the film. You've been to Paris? I've never really been anywhere. People are alive there, not like here. I'm going back the first chance I get. Frank Wheeler, I think you're the most interesting person I've ever met. What do you think? I guess I kind of like it. Won't you miss the city? Nothing's permanent, right? Right. Love me, love me, love me, say. Look at us. We're just like everyone else. We bought into the same ridiculous delusion. Let me fly. This idea that you have to settle down, resign from life. With you. I want to feel things. Really feel them. A man only gets a couple of chances in life. It won't be long before he's sitting around wondering how he got to be second rate. We can't go on pretending that this is the life we wanted. I support you, don't I? I work 10 hours a day at a job I can't stand. You don't have to. But I have the backbone not to run away from my responsibilities. Who made these rules anyway? Just because you got me safely in this little trap, you think you can bully me into feeling whatever you, you want me to feel? In a trap. Yes. You yes. In a trap. Pleased to have Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet back at this table. Welcome. Thank you, Thank sir, you. for having Thank us. Thank you, you very much. Uh, why did it take 11 years for you two to get back together? <laughs> well, we hated each other so much in the it, beginning. It was hard to overcome we the hate. We had to run away. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, a combination of reasons, really. We, um, we had had... Uh, lots of conversations about the possibility of working together again and I think we both um, just felt that that thing hadn't really come along um, but we also knew that whatever it was whatever that piece of material might be um, it had to be completely different to Titanic um, and uh, and it took 11 years I think just to to both feel the same way about a piece of material, to both react to it um, in a very emotional way and uh, and to feel that we could use the history that we have together and the trust and the friendship that we've developed over the years and really have that play a large part in um, our portrayal of Frank and April Wheeler. And, so when you uh, saw the script, helped. you knew it was right? I really did. I really did. You know, I, I, I read the script and... Um, was just blown away uh, by the fact that it hadn't been turned into a movie already, number one, but secondly, the power of the the story, the um, the clarity of every single character in this piece. It's so solid. The dialogue was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, and quietly inside myself, I did think, OK, maybe maybe Leo and I could do this together. And, and then my next thought was, wow, I wonder if Sam would direct it. And uh, I, I still am kind of really blown away by the fact that it, it, it all came together like this. You need to watch out for what you wish for. <laughs> Maybe mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you saw this and said, here it is. Or convince me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had I'd, I'd, uh, met with Sam initially about the project, but this was really something that Kate had been shepherding for a long time and really 
kept her eye on for a long period of time. You know, it wasn't a very successful novel when it came out, and and I think the people who had the rights really wanted to get the proper people involved to make that sort of transition into cinema a, a good one because it could have been butchered. And after reading the novel, uh, as um, as interesting as the script was, I mean, the novel just lent itself so completely to 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 actors. I mean, here you have this tremendous amount of subtext. I mean, Yates was able to sort of channel into each one of these characters' minds in a way that I've never, ever seen before. And, and, and it's, it was kind of revolutionary um, and groundbreaking. So when, when, we got to, when I got to read the book after reading the novel, after reading the script, I just said, wow, look at this uh, plethora of, of stuff that I could sort of tap into and all the actors can tap into while making this movie. That's what an actor looks for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the stuff that you essentially have to make up yourself mm. when when um, when doing a movie, and that's complicated work, and it takes a long period of time, and you're not always necessarily the best writer in your own right. You know mm. what I mean? You you have to uh, imagine these things uh, when you put them up on screen. So Yates gave us like mm. the most tremendously complex characters to play that were multifaceted and not necessarily. Um, you know, the, uh, the sympathy switches from yeah, each character right. to the next. You never know sort of who to relay, uh, you know, put your trust into. And, and that's disconcerting and makes the, uh, the whole project very interesting. Just mm -hmm. the trailer gives you some sense, some sense <clears throat> of, of, of the universality of what they are talking about. I mm. mean, the notion of everybody going through mm. a life of asking about, is this what it's all about? Is this what I expected? Mm -hmm. You know, and how do you deal with either... Uh, the sense of fulfillment or the sense of disappointment. Yeah, it's really interesting actually um, now that we're in this position now where we get to talk about this film and the experience of making it but also the story and what it what it means to people and the, this chord that it's striking with people you know it is set in the 50s but it really does have this sort of universal theme that uh, translates to to any period of time you know you, yeah, any, you, you any kind of lives any kind of life absolutely you know you only you know, you're only happy if you're happy deep down inside of yourself. And mm. the truth is, every single character in this film is looking for that happiness, you know, wanting to have those questions answered for them. And, you know, it, it's it's been so interesting to hear people say, wow, you know, I really, I went home and I did sit there and have a scotch and think to myself, is this the life that I wanted? And, or should and, I go to Paris? And, or should yeah, I go to Paris? And, and, or should I go to Paris? Blow my brains out. Yeah, and do I have the do I have the courage to uh, to yeah. change it and do anything about it? You know, yeah. um, but it do, it really does make people think. And uh, and as an actor, that's you know that's that's one of the great things about this job. It's the actor's privilege to attempt to make people and think and to and to tackle great material yes absolutely and uh, really <laughs> get your hands <laughs> now, as dirty was, as you can was there any part of sam that said <laughs> I, i've done this i have done suburban life before yeah he did he did say that didn't he i mean he he was very um he, he was very honest about that, you know, early on. He said, look, there's, yeah, there's no point in me pretending that I haven't made a story set against a suburban backdrop before. Um, but to him, it was such a different story, such a different period of time, and the characters are so wildly different to the characters in American Beauty. Um, and he is just fascinated by the human condition. Um, and in this particular case, uh, you know, the plight of Frank and April Wheeler, who are you know, such extraordinary characters, um, but at the same time, as Leah was saying, unbelievably complex and complicated, mm. and uh, and also trying to, to stay together, you know. This is a story about two people who will do whatever they can to find what it was that they had when they first met. Um, they're not trying to pull away from each mm. other. Mm. Um, they're dealing with their own reality at the same time trying to... Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, their and own honesty, I think. That's right, that's right. And, and, and the, the honesty that, uh, that, that they share as a married couple ends up resulting in this incredible cruelty between the two of them. I mean, we got to be so mean to each other, <laughs> Leo and I, and, uh, and it was great, <laughs> it was so great, <laughs> wasn't it? I'm just going to sit here and see how you react to that. <laughs> <laughs> he loved it more than I did, Jerry. Uh, did you? <laughs> I did. <laughs> well, you, it's, it's, you mean it, engaging in the cruelty that the script demanded? Well, it was one of the first things uh, about the screenplay, which I immediately said, why well, I, I really cannot wait to do those sequences with Kate, because when you develop a, a sort of 
you know, a friendship with somebody over the years, there's just a trust factor there. We both know that we have the best intentions for each other, but we also know that we can sort of push each other's limits. And there's probably no other actress out there that I would feel as comfortable sort of attacking. And I know she could give every bit of it right back to me. So that's a, I, I kept saying during the production of the film, I can't wait for these sequences. And so much of the movie was about what was left unsaid between two people. And mm. Sam really set this movie up like a stage play, almost like, you know, we were kind of living these people's lives out. I don't know, it was a, a great release, so to speak. And for me, you know, just to continue with that thought, you know, for me as, a, as an actress, working alongside my wonderful friend over there. Um, Who wants to test your limits. But it was some of the most exciting acting I've ever seen in my life. It really, really was. And, and, and being there for Leo in the off-camera during some of those very difficult, heightened emotional scenes between the two of us, it was very hard for me not to cry um, just because he, it was really upsetting for me to see him go to that place and to be so moved by what he was doing and also to see him literally do things with his face and as an actor that I have never seen him do before in any of his performances or as a human being. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying Man, to him, wow. I, I seriously, you just did things with your face that y you've honestly never done before and I'm very freaked out by right now and have to go and sit down. <laughs> um, but it was exciting for us to, you know, just to explore the endless possibilities. And, uh, you know, I think um, that's why, you know, it's, it's easy for us to talk about. Does this what experience. she's saying resonate with you? I have to be honest and say I never know. Uh, I, I just, I think we both share the same sort of need to do a good job. We want to do the be give the best possible performances that we can, we, we work very hard at what we do, but whatever suspends that disbelief for an audience, whatever makes an audience member feel like, oh, I believe that, and what, all those factors that are involved, I have, I've st I'm still yet to figure out, because um, that formula is something that uh, is intangible. You, know, you, don't, you never quite know what will be yeah. off-putting towards people, and I've, I've never really discovered that. You just look for the best possible you know. But but is part of the goal you're reaching for is to make the character believable, absolutely. So that they yeah. don't they see nothing but the character. Well, all you essentially do, I mean, all the research that you do beforehand, all the conversations that you have, all the rehearsal, all the thinking about the lines, the changing of the lines, that all this stuff is, uh, you know, a a desire to find some sort of emotional truth within mm. that character, and that's all you consistently do. Um, uh, 24 hours a day when you're working. I mean, mm. that's it. Mm. And um, that's a, it's a sort of, uh, like I said, it's a formula that I don't think anyone truly understands because when I see a movie, there could be one of 2,000 factors that make me say, oh, I'm watching a movie. I don't have that suspension of disbelief. I can't sit there for two hours and say, I can't forget that element of that film. And it could be a piece of set decoration. It could be, uh, you know, a piece of terrible acting, terrible directing. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be a combination of anything or the storyline as a whole or what one character does. So who knows? And that's what we're constantly attempting to do as actors or people in this industry is that mm. try to find that one little gem where that, that chemistry is right. You know that you can push her to her limits. What does that mean? <laughs> Again, I have no idea. <laughs> 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 no, you know but what it you is. You just know you enjoy it. People use and that. It makes you better. <laughs> people use that term shorthand. Is there a shorthand between you two people, or yeah. do you guys? Yeah. What it is is the the ability to know that I'm not going to insult this person if I tell them the truth. You know, I'm. If we talk about the material and I say this scene sucks, you mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm not going to insult her. Or you weren't that great in conveying what I think you were trying to convey. Or you were. You, you are, know? or you're not going to say that. Well, you know what I'm saying? We were able to do that, and Without, we, we yeah. took advantage of that friendship. We really took advantage of the fact that we know each other on such a, you know, for such a long period of time, we know we have the best intentions for each other. We took advantage of that for this one. We really yeah, we did. did. And, and, you know, and I was, you know, I was, I was actually sort of th th thrown by how, I don't know, sort of psychic I sometimes felt of you. You know, I would see Leo try something in a take and I would, as he was delivering a line, I could see him saying the line right to me and thinking, this isn't working at all. And, <laughs> and it was brilliant. And I would say to him afterwards, you didn't think that worked, did you? And he would say, no, no. What, how, how would you know that? I was like, babe, come on. And by the way, it did completely work. But then in the same breath, we were also able to say to each other, but go back to doing that thing you did two takes ago because that really worked for you. 
Um, yeah. But we don't have, just to go back to what Leah was saying, you know, I don't think either of us particularly have a very powerful radar of whether what we're doing is good or very good, as you were saying. You know, it's about being real and more real, you know, um, and sometimes you can have a sense of yes, God, my God, I don't know who I am in this moment because something happened to me just then. But you don't know if it's good, bad or ugly. I mean, you honestly don't. Um, and there were times when you'd be doing a take and you'd stop in the middle and go, ah, no, let me start again. And I, I would say, what are you talking about? Just don't cut, don't keep going. And you would do the same thing with me. And, um, and as Leo said, we, we were able to rely on each other and trust each other's judgment in those moments when we sometimes didn't know whether what we were doing it's, it's was good or bad. It's just great to have bad, somebody yeah. after you do a take yeah. to say, how was that? Was that yeah. crap? You, 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 do I really you, suck? You, I suck, right? I really suck. <laughs> no, no, you don't. And you're <laughs> okay. okay. You suck. And, you know, uh, and you could only do this with the, between the two of you because there's a relationship, there's an experience, there is a respect, and mm -hmm. therefore mm -hmm. you are more likely to be willing to um, fly without a net. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, I think we, you know, in many ways <clears throat> provided that safety net for each other, but, but more importantly, Sam really was this was unbelievable that, yeah. support mechanism for all of us. And, and the, the way that he rehearsed the actors, the way that he brought us all together as a company, I mean, it didn't even, to use the word the cast or the talent, just doesn't even occur to me in this instance. We were a company of people. He brought us together like he would his company of actors in a theatre, as Leo was just saying. We rehearsed for, I think it was over three weeks, like quite a long time. And, and, and in Are rehearsal, these just readings around a table or actually doing scenes? Literally, do, like, as we're doing now. Right. Lots of coffee, <laughs> lots of cigarettes, <laughs> and lots of pieces of paper and script everywhere. And everybody feeling free to talk about their characters, each other's characters, this scene, bits from the book that we were sad to, to lose. Um, being able to have the conversation with Sam and the screenwriter Justin Hayes about why they had chosen to leave certain things out, um, understanding it from their perspective and, and, and them encouraging us to tell us what our perspective was. And it really was um, a collaborative effort and uh, these you know, bonds were bound um, in that rehearsal room. And, uh, and then Sam did this other wonderful thing that Leo has talked extensively about, um, which is he, he shot it in sequence in as much as we could with the exception of uh, all the work at the Knox building, which is Leo's, uh, Frank Wheeler's place of work, um, it was shot in story order. So, right. you know, by the time we got to those big difficult scenes at the end, we were so ready to go. Um, and and, and that, was, that was intentional on Sam's part. Would you do more of that if you could have them shoot it in sequence? Oh, it's, it's tremendously helpful. Yeah. It really is because there's always that... Uh, that own unknown period as an actor when you're entering uh, you know these film roles where you have so many questions that are yet to be answered and to live you know out a, a sort of microcosm of their life in sequential order all these questions sort of become answered as you're trying to portray this person's life and uh, I mean I think it would have been a terrible disservice certainly in this movie to do any of these end sequences any of them oh. towards the beginning of the film because we just didn't have the a, well, a deep understanding of who these people were yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's only so much you can obtain from the book or the screenplay, but to experience it, to live it out is uh, a necessity. And, and that comes all from, you know, Sam Mendes' theater's ex theater experience and his ability to work with actors and his knowledge of what actors need. Mm -hmm. And he would ask very interesting, penetrating questions right in the middle of doing a take. Like to, what? Like, you know, walking to your car. And I'm, I remember one instance walking to my car going to work, and I sort of look back and... And I have a sort of look of disillusionment on my face, and Sam goes, "Well, what do you, what do you think he's really feeling right now?" And I said, "Oh God, I'll, well, I thought he was a little sad, but yeah, but why? Why? Why do you? Why do you feel like he feels that? Is he is he connected with her yet? Mm. Oh, maybe he isn't. Oh, and then it, so it makes you, you know, he's not necessarily directing you, but he's making you sort of get this, you know, this sort of self discovery about who this person mm. is, and saying, "Oh wow, I didn't mm. think of it that way." Okay. I need to re-ask myself that question, you know? There's a sort of immediate response that you have as an actor to what you're supposed to do, but when you have somebody mm. asking you the proper questions, it, uh, it, it's those, that fine-tuning that makes, uh, I think, a good performance. Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing skill yes, uh, to is. have, to make you, uh, it, make you want to ask questions to get deeper inside. Mm -hmm. of, but of, it's, yeah, it absolutely is, and it's also unbe unbelievably um, 
clever on Sam's part because was it what it does for the actor is it makes them own their character more than the director and more than any other actor in the piece and he absolutely encouraged that from the word go it's it's your character what do you think only you know yeah. how this should be you've played. invested more into this one you. person than yeah. anybody i can on explain the this line to you i can tell you what i think it means yeah. but at the end of the day none of that matters you know only you know you go and it also gives you a huge amount of confidence as an actor too you know at the end of the day you know actors are very strange human beings we're extremely pathetic and very what needy and what are you talking about <laughs> it's true yeah. oh, wait, stop. 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 <laughs> strange <laughs> pathetic well let's think about it you know we go to work every day and we, we go to work every day and we pretend to be somebody else what the heck is that about? is that strange or pathetic or both it's a combination <laughs> of uh, you know we can all be extremely this, needy and everybody you know? in this audience why Watching this is saying, I would like to be her. Or I'd like to be him. <laughs> you know? um, Not strange or pathetic. But you know, I want to be. Sam did this wonderful thing of. Uh of of boosting the confidence levels, he he really did. Boosted and, the confidence levels. Yeah, and and what happens to an actor when the, your director makes you feel very um, very powerful is is you are so unafraid to try anything. Number one, but number two. You just don't care about who's watching, looking stupid, making mistakes, tripping up, trying an idea that just doesn't work. I mean, I would sometimes say things to Sam and think, man, he's never going to go for this, you know. And I would say, can I just try one that's a little bit, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he would say, yeah, try it, absolutely try it. You never know until you try. And sometimes some of the most spontaneous moments come out of an absolutely off-the-wall idea mm -hmm. that I myself, perhaps with other directors, wouldn't have the confidence to say, can I just try one like this? I know it's kind of crazy. Nothing to say was crazy nothing at all um, and for me just as his wife one of the most rewarding things about the experience of working with him was actually watching him with uh, with everybody else observing him with the other actors you know he was very different with Leo to the way he was with me he was so tender and dear wasn't he with Kathy Absolutely. he was just amazing with Kathy and and he sort of adapted himself like a great teacher you know he sort of adapted himself to the needs of every different individual child you know in the way that every child is different a so kind is of psychologist actor. who understood yeah absolutely their being. how often does something like this come along for you did you see a lot of properties that have all this potential it is a literary masterpiece so it's a throwback to when that stuff sort of mattered and that's mattering less and less in today's day yeah, and age yeah. you know so it is rare it's extremely rare and it's you know, it, like we've been talking about, it was like doing a theater production. It was like a piece of actor's studio work. It was a different genre of film than, than we're used to. I mean, here are two pretty pathetic, self-indulgent people at the end of the day. These are the characters. These are the characters. Uh, I mean, I think they're striving for happiness. I, I think that, as a matter of fact, uh, April's character is the only heroic one in this story. I think my character is tragically unheroic. He does not have the courage to lead the life he wants to. He want, so he he's unheroic because he, as we saw in the, and we'll see again, he's there simply saying, look, I work 10 hours a day. I'm yeah. trying to make things okay. And, and can't and, you see I'm doing my best and it's not easy and I don't like my work. And well, to she's me, heroic because she says, let's go to Paris. To me, I felt like all he wanted to do inevitably at the end of the day was be patted on the head and told, good boy, you're doing a good job. You know what I mean? Like any man would, you're providing for your family and your children, and you're doing a good job, and I love you for that. That's all Frank really wanted at the end of the day, but he didn't, he didn't have the courage to do anything more. He was his father's son. He worked at the same job. He, he was unhappy probably with his life and his existence there, but didn't have the courage to, to take that, had, have that one chance to correct that, and, and she did. She was willing to sacrifice everything, mm -hmm. and that, to mm -hmm. me, about the character was what I found the most intriguing and the most... Fun. I mean, if you about were to, your character. about my character, yeah. if you were to make up a story like this in today's era, say, in in the in the, in the suburbs, there would have to this this couple would have to win the lottery or have accidentally killed somebody and stuffed them in their garage, <laughs> and there would have to be some yes. explosive element in to, order to, to change make their it lives. work. It yeah. wasn't yeah. a psychoanalysis of uh, <clears throat> of two people that are, yeah. you know, trying to find happiness but are on two different courses in life and are trying their best to retain what they once had. But did the character see her as heroic or not? It depends on how you look at it, you know. I mean, it's... When I first read the novel, I thought it was so much about the time period. 1950s, post-World War II, 
this great migration to the suburbs, what the idyllic, the iconic American family represented, the role of the man and the woman in the household, the man providing, the woman staying home, being the housewife. This is the beginning of like, you know, prescription medication that we mm -hmm. were taking, wife yeah. swapping, <laughs> drinking, yes. all yes. this stuff. And it was a, from the confines of the suburbs. I thought that that was the main theme. All that, when we did the movie, systematically got stripped away. Yeah. I mean, it became more and more about two people alone in a room trying to figure their life out and mm. desperately understanding that it's not working. And that, that to me, at the core of, is what, like Kate was saying, made this novel so timeless and such a literary masterpiece because you can read it now and, you know, mm. and, and have a deep emotional connection to all these characters and there's no one clear cut you know, person that you have sympathy with, right? I mean, yeah, it shifts. Absolutely. I was very struck by <clears throat> in the screenplay that Justin Hayes, you know, he's, this is the other thing, Justin Hayes <laughs> is a young man. He's like our age. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he's 34. He's, I think he's the same age as you. And um, somehow he understood this material so intrinsically. And uh, he, he did this wonderful thing rhythmically with the screenplay of, you never feel as though you're supposed to be focusing on any one character. You feel as an audience member that you're absolutely allowed to sympathize with both of them simultaneously and at different times too. So in one scene you can be thinking, oh my God, you know, poor April, all she wants is possibility in life. She wants something to hope for. And there's her husband having an affair with this young secretary and, you know, and she can't see it. She's blind to all of this stuff. And then in the next moment you think, oh my gosh, poor Frank, mm. you know, here's April saying, you know. <laughs> you're not a man unless <laughs> you're, you're not too. a man. Look at you, look at you and tell me how you can call yourself a man. Mm -hmm. And it, it's this sort of push me, pull you feeling that uh, it swings and roundabouts throughout the movie and, uh, and that makes the character I think all the more um, compelling and uh, dynamic and ultimately engaging. Uh, did for you see her as heroic? I did, yeah. yeah. I absolutely did. I, you know, she, they, they both of these characters are an incredible combination of both strength and weakness. I think that, that, that Frank is weaker than April, and we've talked about this a lot. Um, April is ultimately the victim of her own strength. Because she has more courage and she's more willing to change. It's to do with courage, absolutely, and it's to do with a, not only a willingness to change, but a desperation for change. You know, she has no possibility for change or hope or unpredictability in her life, you know. This was not the life that she wanted, and she says it to Frank, we can't go on pretending that this is mm. the life we wanted. Roll tape, here's a scene. Is this you? Yeah. You been to Paris? I've never really been anywhere. Well, maybe I'll take you with me then, huh? I'm going back the first chance I get, I tell you. People are alive there, not like here. <laughs> All I know, April, is I want to feel things. Really feel them. I think you're the most interesting person I've ever met. Ain't that a lie? <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she was lying big oh, time, yeah. wasn't she? Oh, bless her shit, and what she was getting herself <laughs> into, did she? didn't into, know did she? mundane existence that was <laughs> she, set forth from she those comments. She thought you were glamorous and bohemian, <laughs> but no, you were Mr. No. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> There's something to that, too, and... <laughs> Definitely is. Life is not exactly how you perceived mm. it at first meeting. No, absolutely not. Um, the most interesting man I've ever known. I think mm. the most interesting person <laughs> I've ever met. You know, the truth is, I think she, I, I think in that moment she absolutely meant it. Of she course she did. Absolutely, in that moment, in that moment meant it. You know, but uh, there's an interesting backstory um, for April in in the novel, which uh, which was shot actually and was going to be used in the film as flashbacks when she was a child, and the same with, with Frank's character, flashbacks to when he was a child. Mm. And tonally, Sam felt that it was, it was unnecessary. Um, he didn't like the feeling that the audience was being told that, you know, these characters had been messed up by their parents, therefore understand them, forgive them. He wanted um, the audience to experience Frank and April as we were able to experience yeah, exactly. them as actors um, and not put them in the past tense in any way or at as all. victims. Or as victims, absolutely. Yeah. They, they, you know, they, they, they could not be victims. All right, roll tape is another scene. Frank, I have had the most wonderful idea. I've been thinking about it all day. Baby, what, what's all this about? Hmm? 
Do you know how much money we have saved? Enough to live on for six months without you earning another dime. And with the money we could get from the house and the car, longer than that. What we could get for the house? Sweetheart, wh what are you talking about? Where are we going to live? Paris. What? You always said it was the only place you'd ever been that you wanted to go back to. The only place that was worth living. So why don't we go there? You're serious? Yes. What's stopping us? What's stopping us? Well, I can think of a number of different things. For example, what kind of a job could I possibly get? You won't be getting any kind of a job. Because I will. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. Listen a minute. Do you know what they pay for secretarial positions in government agencies in Europe? No, I don't. Listen, Frank, I'm serious about this. Do you think I'm kidding or okay, something? Okay, okay, I just have a couple of questions is all. For one thing, what exactly am I supposed to be doing while you're out earning all this money? Hmm? But don't you see? That's the whole idea. You'll be doing what you should have been allowed to do seven years ago. You'll have time. For the first time in your life, you'll have time to find out what it is that you actually want to do. And when you figure it out, you'll have the time and the freedom to start doing it. So what's happened between the first scene we saw and the second scene? Well, uh, it's interesting because in the novel, um, there's a tremendous amount of dissatisfaction between the two characters once they've um, sort of in. settled into the suburbs. And she's uh, tremendously unhappy there. I'm unhappy with my job. And a lot of that was stripped away in the movie because unless we had uh unless the audience was invested in this idea of paris this sort of idyllic dream that would solve all of their problems and unless you saw the, how that sort of transformed their life and changed them then the the sort of spiral downwards wouldn't wouldn't have been effective i don't think and mm -hmm. of course paris ultimately is an illusion i mean paris is uh they could have gone there who knows what would have happened but to me i think these people were sort of destined to be apart that's what I feel anyway. I mean, we all have our own opinions about it, and we t we've talked about it, but uh, it could be that one chance that could have resurrected their marriage, but I think that these were, like I said, two trains on far, f way different tracks in life that um, mm. just missed. Do you disagree with any of that? No. I'm just sitting here thinking, God, it, just everything you're saying is absolutely exactly the way that you I feel. You came Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, when I think about those scenes right there, you know, the first scene that you that you saw is when they have just met. It's literally the night after they meet at a party for the first time, and she's talking about, you know, you should have been allowed to do what you wanted to do, set, wanted to do seven years ago. You'll have time, you know. And she's talking about this period of time since they got married, since they started having children, and uh, and I think about the scenes towards the end of the film and just how, you know, they're like open wounds, both of them, you know, and. Uh, and they're like throwing knives at each other, practically. Um, and they just get to a point where the unspoken tension between them, the um, the things they've never had the chance to say to each other, just come out in the most venomous way. But it, it almost has to be that honest. They have to have that level of mm. honesty and brutality with each other in order to just feel something and be heard. Um, and I just. I'm just struck by it watching these scenes again, you know, it's uh it's it's so it's so real, isn't it? I mean, it is so real that quest for happiness. And I I look at April and I think, oh God, look at her, look at her. She is so excited by this idea of just change, <laughs> possibility. It doesn't have to be like this. Come on, look at us. We always said that we were better than this. Let's be those people, can't we? Can't we? Have we forgotten how to do that? It's so touching, you know, because it just bless a little heart. It was never going to be. But you also look at yourself and say, Jesus, Kate, you have, uh, when you deal with material like this, you understand how it all can go wrong mm. uh, and how you can get mired down. Mm -hmm. And then you look at yourself and say, on some scale, you know, I have, you know, I mean, I've touched all the right places, well, so to speak. Certainly... I mean, you know, in terms of Sam, in terms of career, in terms of people you work with, in terms of, of uh, life being some of what you wanted or or did you oh, want man. something very differently that oh no you know i mean the truth the truth is that the career that i have and the life that i have you know this is not what i expected at all i i never expected so, any of this i you know i'm still so if you coming... had, didn't have this you wouldn't be disappointed no 
No. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, my, my nature is I, I'm a pretty positive person, you know. I can find inspiration in a cardboard box. You know, I've just always been one of those people. And, and uh, I think Leo and I had the very similar upbringing, you know, very much kind of hand-to-mouth existence. You do whatever you can to make things work. And, you know, f to have fun, you don't have to throw money at a situation. Um, and so because I grew up like that, I don't need lots of things to make me happy. Um, and I just am unbelievably uh, blessed to, 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 to know myself, you know. And the person that I'm married to, you know, just that feeling of to be known. It's so incredible mm. to be known by that person and the peace of mind that gives you and to, the happiness to, to have a that partner comes out that, of it. To have a husband, to have someone yeah. that really gets you. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I have to let you go. I'm going to, as you go, we'll show one more scene, and then Leo's going to stay with me and finish out this uh, hour for this program. You have another premiere of another movie. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's weird. So I say goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Oh my God, their faces. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know what this is like, April? Honestly. Just talking like this, the whole, the whole idea of, of going off to Europe this way. This is the way I felt going up to the line the first time in the war. I mean, I, I, was, I was probably just as scared as everyone else, but, but inside, I never felt better. I felt, I felt alive. I felt full of blood. I felt everything just, everything seemed more real. The guys in their uniforms, the, the, the snow on the fields, the trees, and all of us, all of us just walking. I mean, I, I, I was scared, of course, but I just kept thinking, this is it, you know? This is the truth. I felt that way once, too. When? The first time you made love to me. Here's a sense I have. You don't do this often. Mm -hmm. uh, we ask frequently. I assume in, in that you choose to do it when there is material that you feel special about and that you like a lot and you want more people to know about. That could be the case. That could be the case, yes. Um, but my attitude towards publicity in general has always been um, um, very bizarre. I, I've never quite... To me... Um, you know, I have heroes. I have great heroes from the past that I felt always retained a level of mystery about their life. And that, for me, was all thrown out the window when I did the film Titanic. So <laughs> when I did that movie, I realized there it was never no quite mystery. the same. So, you know, and, and I think that is fundamentally truly important for, for an actor to be able to, like I, like I was talking earlier, to, to suspend that disbelief. If you know way too many things intimately about a, a specific human being, they're not able to convey those characters realistically to an audience. You, you feel like, oh, that's not him, he's just acting. Yeah. Or that he, they're nothing like that. And so, uh, yes, I, I, I feel like I, when there is specific material that I feel deserves uh, this type of forum, I, I, I do seize those moments, so you're right. What is it you most want us to know about Frank? To see the character and not you. Well, what I, I can tell you what I love about him and what I love about Frank is you, so often in this industry, like I was saying earlier, you, you're, you're given characters that have some heroic element to them, something that defies the odds. And this is somebody that is, like I said, a product of their environment and just is a simple man. You know what I mean? He's a simple man who wants a simple life at the end of the day and wants to be told that he's a good husband. and. And I, I found it immediately, I, I related to him immediately. I really did. I related to his angst immediately. I mean, it's hard for me to identify more with the characters that do defy the odds, the heroic people that uh, risk their life time and time again to, you know, with some, you know, uh, in some vigilant pursuit of justice. This is a man that is just trying to make things work. And Why is it harder and harder to identify with the heroics? Because you what? Because I lead a life uh, oh. nowhere near that, my friend. Uh, uh, I mean, I go to these these sets and uh, <laughs> you know I get jobs and I research yeah. characters and I yeah, get I paid money to yeah. be an actor so yeah. you know it's um, 
I mean, there's obviously sometimes where you, you just do have an emotional connection to somebody, even if your life is nothing like them. And I, ha I remember sitting here talking with you about the aviator and Howard yeah. Hughes, and, and right. I, I larger than life. That was one of those characters in my life where I felt like I need to. Uh, I felt a connection with the man. I felt that I needed to put this guy's life up on screen, and it was something that took eight eight years to sort of hone and get right. And those are, are the, but those things come few and far between, and and they come become they're less and less. Um, uh, those possibilities are less and less. I think in in today's age of cinema, I really, you know, it's hard to make make movies like that. It really is. Well, then that sort of relates to my question about how often you see material like this. Not often. Not often. Not often yeah. at all. And I think there's going to be a, a wider gap between the sort of independent genre of filmmaking and the big budget sort of spectacle movies. And the movies that are a hybrid of those two things that, that have, you know, real uh, powerful emotional or you know, deep content in them that are also have some scope are going to kind of dissolve away. I, I see that happening more and more in the industry. It's either like... This is the, you know, a regurgitation of films you've seen a thousand times at work and are, you know, sound for the studios and this is what we're making. Or you could take a chance and do a really low budget small movie and see how it turns out. You know, I, I feel so like... So that's the gap between either take a small budget film uh, and see how it turns out yeah, or less some and spectacular, less of, yeah. but no way in between in which you are... Enhancing those the types of movies are capacity to tell a story that's worth telling. Those types of movies are, are are becoming few and far between. Yes. Is it possible that you could take more risk in whatever way? Back to even Frank's character, to see that you, because of whatever leverage and resource you have, mm. to make those kind of movies. That's what um, I'm trying to do. <laughs> you are. I'm trying my and, best. And how do you try to do it? How do I try to do it? I mean, I mean unconscious. Looking for property. Looking for. Everything at the end of the day when you're making a movie starts with the material and, and, and how well written the script is. I've never seen a silk purse made from a sow's ear. Yes. I've never seen it happen wherein a crap script with crap characters, a director somehow found a way to make a masterpiece out of it. And that's the constant struggle that we all sort of have as actors is finding those gems. And that's why people grab onto them like vultures. When, when you find a great piece of material or a great script, it's like... You should see what happens. It's like a piranha feeding fest. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Everyone wants it. Everyone Are wants you, it. well, how, why then did it take 11 years to make this movie? You know, it wasn't a huge, I mean, although this was a cult novel and way ahead of its time, it wasn't one of those best sellers. It was kind of those yeah, things, yeah. and a, a small group of people knew how special this novel was. And, and uh, you know, thank God the people that were involved in, in owning material waited. Okay, so, but just help me understand how many I mean, how many of those in which, if the world or, or if smart people like you knew about, would be like piranhas trying to get to it. I mean, are there four or five pieces out there like that? I mean, are you do you have them? I'm looking for one right now. My looking friend. for one. Actively me? looking for a good mm -hmm. piece of material. Interesting. Yeah. With all that you have, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense of clout, you're looking for an interesting piece of material. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and so I, I think the, a lot of people will tell you the same I'm thing. I'm sure they would. They it, do. It's, it's very difficult. I mean, uh, I mean, I could go on and on about it, but it's just the simple truth. I mean, look at how many films have been done. Look at how many uh, subjects have been taken on. Um, you know, hopefully, as we progress into the future, we'll see cinema sort of take different turns, and, and I'm curious to see where it goes. But, uh, you know, it's up to these sort of revolutionary new filmmakers and... and and people coming up with new concepts and ideas, and that's what we're constantly waiting for. But also, it, it, it is a business at the end of the day, and studios will not finance certain projects. I mean, they'll take low risk with low budget films and say, okay, this is a dark piece yeah. of material that not many people will go see. Here's a few million dollars to go right. make yeah. that. We or, know that the ceiling it can reach is right. 30 million, 40 million. But maybe so. we'll get an Oscar buzz, yeah. and more right. people will see it. Maybe right. we'll make some money, we'll a little prestige. But I, I just feel like. I have seen less and less of, of those sort of bigger budget films that actually have a tremendous amount of death, a depth uh, dissipate. That's what I've seen anyway. Has acting turned out to be all that you wanted it to be? Um, it's incredible. It's incredible. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I never knew that I could do it as a career. I never knew. I, I, it was the first memory that I had. It's the first thing I can think of is saying, I want to be an actor to my parents. And uh, if I hadn't lived in Los Angeles and 
been in such close proximity to sort of the mecca of movie making. If I didn't have parents that said, okay, we'll drive you to auditions, we didn't have the economic means to, you know, move camp from Idaho to Los Angeles right, because right. some snotty 10-year-old kid says, I want to be an actor. <laughs> you know, we, we did it, and I, after school I got to go on auditions, but it was always, and I've said this before, it felt like an elite group of people, and it felt like I would never belong to them. So once I got the opportunity to, to for example, get the movie This Boy's Life with Robert De Niro, I said, wow, now yeah. I'm able to... Not, I, I might be able to steer the course of my career. I might be able to have a career similar to these guys that I'm, you know, I so admire. And uh, that I knew at 15 years old was the biggest gift in the world. And that that's that's never left me. You know, I've never, I've never that that thirst or that hunger for wanting to give one great performance that I'm truly satisfied with, or be in one movie that I said I love this film uh, is something that I don't know will ever be. Um, quenched I don't know and that's and I think that that's a good thing because it keeps making it keeps pushing you you know um, is it, is you're constantly issue? dissatisfied in other words but have you found it yet I mean do you think in other words do you have to live with the idea that that it's not quite what, what I dream of doing I not acting mm. but finding that performance that character that story it's uh, only in, in other words you won't keep reaching for it if you think you found it well it's only in hindsight really I mean you can't really appreciate anything you've ever done or any movie you've ever been in for me uh, for minimum five years because you're so attached <laughs> to what it was like making the movie that you yeah. can't look at it from a subject you know from a different perspective um so i don't know you know i don't know but i do know that i still have that desire to make great movies you know what's interesting there's a book out by malcolm gladwell which is called outliers you know, and it really is the story of looking at success and, and performance and talent. Mm -hmm. People have achieved something special. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looks at whether, it looks at the Beatles in terms of the phenomenon that they had, to, they had being able to go somewhere and really have a chance to play for a long time. Mm -hmm. The idea also is that 10,000 people who become the best at something spend 10,000 hours practicing doing it. But it's about also the very point you said, you know, you are hit, sitting here because you had parents who lived in L.A. Mm -hmm. who were willing to make some sacrifice, who cared about you having a chance to pursue your dreams. Mm -hmm. But if you had grown up somewhere else with mm -hmm. a different kind of parents, mm -hmm. you might not be sitting here mm -hmm. as Leo DiCaprio, one of America's and one of the world's best-known actors. Yeah. And that in a combination with the fact that uh, you have that one lucky moment. And that you, you can't discount. I mean, no matter, I don't care what anyone says, whether somebody has talent or not, whether they were destined for right, right. a certain career, if you don't get that one opportunity and you're not there at the right time to seize it and you didn't go for it, none of it would happen. I would not have the career I would have right now whatsoever, I don't think. I mean, if, it's all if, about a showcase or it was, that ability it, to do that one thing that says, okay, now we'll allow you to do more movies. That's it. You know. no, was that Titanic or something else? No, that was, to, I think that was either The Spoy's Life or, or Gilbert Grape. Oh, yeah, I was talking about Gilbert Grape, yeah, yeah right. Uh, you know, if I didn't have the, I mean, I was, I would have been very, very happy continuing doing uh, television work. I would have loved it. <laughs> you know, I would have been doing commercials and <laughs> yes. and, and uh, sitcoms. It would have been fine. Yeah. I mean, uh, do, doing some theater. I would. I was ecstatic to be an actor, period. I was finally saying, wow, this I can do this for a living. I don't need to have some other vocation and do this on the side. And that, you know, growing up in this industry, I know what a very special gift that is because there's a lot of people that would love to be working actors and unfortunately aren't. And that that's the bottom line for me, what I'm most happy with. This this is all the cherry, this all this, this is the whipped cream and the walnuts and the cherry on the cake. <laughs> Being able to choose your roles, yeah. all this stuff is like, you know, beyond it, it really is. Yeah, but when, when Gilbert Grape happened, um, did you see it? This is my option. This is my opportunity. I've got to be there for this because this could make all the difference in the world. Or did you simply say, man, this is a great role. I'm going to give it all I have. Hmm. Well, that was an interesting uh, decision point. It's funny you bring that up because I, you know, uh, I don't want to do any big sob story about how I grew up and, you know, the financial background that I had. But to to finally have an opportunity after This Boy's Life, that first movie that I did, there was another movie wherein I, I got offered more money than I could have ever imagined. <laughs> and I was about to say yes to it, but there was actually something, and I'm kind of surprised in hindsight looking back as a 16, 17 year old saying, 
wait a minute, there's this role here that um, is substantially less money, but I knew, and that all came from uh, having watched these great movies in the past, that I knew I wanted to strive for doing something a little bit better. And I don't know where that came from. It's really weird. Um, because I should have taken that other role, you know what I mean? But I truly, I had these heroes, you know, I really had these heroes that, um, that I knew did certain types of movies. Who were those heroes? Oh God, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I remember watching, of course, James Dean as a young child saying, I mean, as a young kid, as a 12, 13 year old, um, I, you know, Mitchum, of course, De Niro, of course, Hoffman, I mean, all these guys, I mean, uh, endlessly watching their films. I mean, uh, Monty Clift, of course, of course, Brando, all these guys. They all have something. There, there is a line there, though, that goes through all of them. I mean, it's part sort of clear talent, but it's also sort of there was a kind of outlaw about all of them. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of sort of uh, rebellion about all of them. Mm -hmm. Mitchum, say, mm -hmm. clearly, Dean, clearly. Uh, Brando, mm -hmm. talent, rebellion, outlaw. I mean, there is a certain, the people who appeal to you the most have a certain... Outsider quality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you think of that? I'm a bit of a rogue myself. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you, you mean. You know who the first one was, I think? I would think Cagney. Yeah. I think really Cagney, I remember watching Public Enemy with, uh, with Scorsese, actually. He was screening it for one of the films that we did, and I said, wow, I mean, even predating Brando, this was a guy that came on screen and just, you know, threw all the rules out the window. I mean, Public Enemy was unbelievable. I mean, he just lit up the screen and it was violent, terrifying, it was scary, and he was, and he was, I think, the first in that lineage of that sort of actor studio, even predating Brando, I think. Um, I don't know why I brought that up, but I well, forgot I do, to because, mention well, him. Because he was out of the list. Yeah. Here's what's interesting, and, and I'll close with this. The, it is this notion, uh, you mentioned Marty, mm -hmm. and being showing films and the idea. One of the things that I hope to do here, and he and I have talked about this, is to make more people beneficiary of this man's passion mm. for movies and what he can show you and believes in. So I have that same passion because I have never, ever... No film historian, no one that works at any museum, no uh, cinema, you know, genius that I ever have met that compares uh, passion-wise and knowledge-wise to Martin Scorsese. I mean, the man it is, I don't want to use the word obsessed, but he's consumed and lives and breathes cinema every day of his life. And, and everything is a ref in his life is a reference to film. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he looks at life uh, and th th through different eyes. I mean, he... He's emotionally connected to movies. Now it all comes from his childhood, of course, but... Um, when because of asthma or something, he mm -hmm. had to sit in a theater and watch movies was his way of... I mean, it is infused to, in, in his DNA, unlike anyone I have ever <laughs> met. So I, I, I agree with you on that. I think they're, you know, that... And, I, and he has. I mean, he's done some pretty fantastic documentaries, his journey through Italian cinema, yeah. his journey through cinema, and right. he's, he's, he's done that. So it's about people, I think, reaching out and, you know, trying to tap into that knowledge because it's pretty extensive. He's offered it. Thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Great to see you. Great to see Pleasure. you. Thank you. Thank Leonardo you. DiCaprio. The film opens December 26th, the day after Christmas. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.